Myself and my two business partners have been publishing ski since 95. It's a long time and we've remained the number one snow sports site. Uh, it's been hard work, it's had its ups and downs and uh, there's been a lot of change in that time as you could imagine. My, my experience is mostly as a digital publisher and my contract work at the moment in the last few years is almost entirely in that space. I've touched with e-commerce and online travel and a few other things, but um, and also ran, right? So I've had my day in the sun and it was pretty good uh, for a while, but now it's just, you know, it's just another business and uh, it's waxed and waned over the years. And, you know, today, um, the only thing that keeps it going is the fact that it's still number one and there's an element of just pride and stubbornness, but it's also, it's also become my business card, so I keep tapping away at it to keep it relevant. In 1995, I was managing a ski shop, being a keen skier, and that's just, you know, one of the segues of life, and I ended up in a ski shop in Newcastle. And that's how snow reports were. They were just, they came in on a fax to the ski, into the ski shops, and they <coughs> came into the, uh, and they also went into a fax to the accommodation businesses down in the snow. So for anybody who was a keen skier, there was, you know, on Thursday nights at, on the seven o'clock MBN news, you would get a snippet of a snow report, but it was, being as MBN was part of Channel 9, it was completely perisher focused because Packer owned perisher, and it just sold everything as great all the time. And that was how snow reports were all over the world. And they had a bad reputation, so you pretty much relied on word of mouth, or you walked past the ski shops in the morning. We used to have, hun well, not hundreds, but we would have dozens and dozens of people walk past the ski shop in the morning during the ski season just to get a snow report. So one day this fellow walks in, he's a customer, and he says, let's put the snow reports on the internet. And I go, great, what's internet? <laughs> <laughs> And he was a PhD student in, uh, here at Newcastle Uni. He's a complete propeller head, uh, doing PhD in physics in over the horizon radar. And he was a keen skier. So I swapped him a pair of ski boots and he put the snow reports online. We used to just fax, I'd get the fax in in the morning and god-awful thermal paper, sticky tape it to another piece of paper, fax it back to Ian at the, at the uni, and he would type it into Notepad and put it up on the internet. It was like, it was, it was just so simple. And um, next thing we knew, it was like the number two most popular site in the country with these very early very early uh, reports that started to come in from a couple of the ISPs, and we just went, wow, how did we do that? <laughs> like, you, could, you couldn't even tell. Um, and it started to get quite busy, and our ISP was really interested in what we were doing, and in the beginning, we had a, we had a known business plan. If any of you like South Park, you would know the known business plan. It's like, no idea how we make money out of this. And then, one day I get a phone call, it was in 96, and it's a guy who's running an accommodation business in Jindabyne. And he just says, how much to advertise on your website? And this is pre-GST, and I went, $199. And he went, okay. And I've always forgotten, I've always regretted not keeping the first check that turned up. So we incorporated it and turned it into a business. And uh, we had a few more sales later in that year, but you know, this is, you know, this is a few hundred dollars, this is nothing. Anyway, Ian walks in uh, early January, 97, and he says, have a look at this website. And he points to a, a website it was kind of the Aspen snow site, but it was really random. It was probably GeoCities or something like that. And there was a webcam there, and he said, if we don't do that, we can forget about this. So I sent 
it was just immediately obvious. This is what you wanted as a skier. It was like, it was no brainer. Here's the snow. I'm in the city, there's the snow. And now I can see it. I don't need to listen to the nonsense that the, that the snow reporters are telling us. So uh, we decided this was a good idea and then we tried to figure out how we we're gonna make it happen. And back in the day, of course, there was no networks. There was no internet. Of course, the original webcam in the world was, no, it was coffee cam. Uh, and basically it was it's CCTV, security cameras, and you had to pipe them through a, you know, a PC with a video card and capture that and then figure out how you were going to get that image onto the internet and so on. So, but we thought it was doable and uh, in a moment of madness, I rang up Channel 7 and just pitched this idea and I must have it was like one call and I must have been in the right place at the right time. I got through the gatekeepers and I spoke to this, the right guy, this business development manager. And it was maybe a two minute conversation and he just went, we're in. So now we had to actually build a camera and make it work. We had no idea how to do it. So that was, this was probably, uh, I don't know, March or April. And it was the year of the Threadbow disaster, and that put that gave us a couple of um, because we I would, had skied, lived and skied in Threadbow for a couple of years, so I had all these connections in Threadbow. So the first camera was going to be Threadbow, and off we went. And uh, it was delayed by a couple of months, and we ended up putting it in late September because of the Threadbow disaster, and the damn thing just worked. We walked away, and it worked which revealed itself later as absolute luck. And we got back home after a few days down the snow and rang the business development manager and said, there it is, it's online, it's working. He said, Ripper, how many more can you do? So I said, 15. <laughs> and, uh, and that began a process of me ringing the ski resorts for a few months and trying to get cameras in and of course, None of them had budget for the internet and so on. So uh, one of the first early learnings that I had, and at the time I was reading all about the open source movement, was that there is no better deal than free, right? Free is a lock-in strategy. Because if you give something to someone for free, nobody else can come along later and go, we'll charge you less. Because it doesn't get any less than free. And the arrangement that we made um, was that we would provide the images and they would be our intellectual property and we would supply them back for free for their own website. And we knew then at that time that all that mattered was that we had all of the cameras and a ski resort only had the Threadbow resort cameras and Perisher only had Perisher cameras. So, and of course their, their websites were um, also infant at the time, if non-existent for some of the ski resorts. And I played off the ski resorts one after the other and eventually we stitched up all of the resorts in Australia and I had these contracts. And then the business development manager at Channel 7 got shipped off and I got a new business development manager and she invited us down to Sydney and said, uh, for a meeting and then she sat there and said, well, you know, webcams are cute but they're not good content so we're dropping this. So there I was with all the contracts, holding <laughs> this commitment, and it's the cliche of, mum, dad, I need some money. <laughs> so both myself and Ian ended up, you know, haranguing our parents and anyone who would listen, and we um, scooped up enough capital to actually just go out and do it ourselves. And in the long run, it turned out to be the best thing ever that Channel 7 did for us, was because then we, it was ours. We didn't. We weren't, didn't have any overlords, we just owned it. And uh, it was the killer idea. We put in 17 cams in 19, for the 1998 season, and then we discovered that most of them stopped working really quickly because it was Windows 95, and we ended up doing five trips to the ski resorts and like 15,000 kilometers. 
making these stupid things bloody work. <laughs> uh, but it was a great ride. And I had to make some money because we had all this debt. So we started selling advertising because that was the only thing that made sense. And in those days it was banners and it was the old 486 by 60 ad and it was a lot of hard work for a few years. But it got better. Uh, and I might point out, at this point here, uh, we also realised that the real bread and butter was actually going to be accommodation and putting bums in beds. And that started to grow. So we had advertising from um, banners, but uh, our interest lay with getting all of the accommodation providers online. Uh, accommodation operators. However, you had, to you had to chase the money, and the money was coming in from advertising. Over the next few years, the, um, what was called the effective CPM was just going up and up and up. And we had an agency and uh, in Sydney that started selling for us, and we had a good relationship with them for about 10 years uh, or more. And that all went really well. And during this time, so we're getting to, in this time, there's also the dot-com bubble. And that was when we, a few investors started sniffing around and talking to us. And most of them, you know, it doesn't go anywhere. But we had one investor, or potential investor, and the conversation started to get pretty serious. And it's just pre-99 pre the end of the 90s, pre the dot-com bust back then. And we hit a stumbling block and it was one of those things you just don't see coming. And it was that the ski.com.au domain had been registered in a time which was so early back in 95 that it couldn't be shifted and it couldn't, from their point of view, it couldn't be turned into an asset. So we had this this block and lawyers started getting involved and they are so expensive and they don't help much. And, uh, and it was feeling really exciting. We were going to get this big, big corporate in Sydney was going to invest in the site and then the bubble just crashed and boom, they were gone like that. Just overnight, just disappeared, never heard from them again. So again, we just kept going on our merry way and the uh, publishing, which effectively was the driver of the business, became pretty good. And at one point, so by around about 2005, 2006, we're nine people um, having a great time, you know, <clears throat> hoofing off to the snow whenever it suited us. Everybody loved us, free ski holidays, doesn't get better. But the party always ends. It always ends. <laughs> and what happened was in, uh, a number of things collided in around about 2006. So one of them was um, the business, the two parts of our business, which is basically selling advertising and trying to get accommodation online. And we'd spent a lot of money in the sort of mid-2000s trying to get uh, a booking engine in place for ourselves. And the lesson that we learned out of that was it doesn't scale. Building technology for 300 potential customers is really expensive. And what if came in and just hoovered it up just because they didn't go, oh, ski lodges. They went, oh, the whole of Australia. And uh, very quickly, they had a lot of money and $30 million of, of capital to invest in engineering means that, it, you know, you just can't keep up. So that meant that you had to, I rang them up one day just because after we'd blown like a couple of hundred thousand dollars on technology that went nowhere. And I rang them up, I rang up what if shortly after they had gone on the IPO, uh, and they had listed and they had got whatever it was, 50 or $100 million in capital and said, are you doing an affiliate plan? And they said, oh, yes. And so we became the first affiliate, which was good, 
but then you know, you're just on their coattails. There's no way you can take your growth. And the other thing that happened in this period was <coughs> Google purchased DoubleClick. DoubleClick was the biggest network advertiser in the world at the time. And Google was all about search marketing. So uh, effectively, Google then bought up the bulk of the world's display advertising, threw all their engineers at it, made it incredibly efficient, and effective CPMs started to drop, and they fell like a stone. And so back here, when we were getting what was good money, $45 or better, up to $80, it dropped down to $5 pretty quickly, sat there for a long time, and after a while it sits there about a dollar, right? And the reason for that is that the internet just scales infinitely. It's like selling sand, you know? There's just, there's no limit to banner impressions. And so the only people who end up making money is the transport company. And that transport company is Google. And the other thing is that at, at, after 10 years, we just saddled with a bucket load of old tech. You know, technology has the shelf life of a banana and you've got to keep turning it over and you have to uh, throw, at, at about, about 10 years, you basically just have to throw out everything that you had and you effectively start all over again. And so that's what happened to us in around 2008. All our webcams that were running on PC-based systems had come to an end of life. The bum had fallen out of uh, the display advertising market. Uh, we were getting crushed in, in putting bums in beds, you know, the booking engine stuff by what if. And we basically had to start all over again and we rebuilt the site from scratch. And so that's the lesson is you just, you have to have your game plan just, it just keeps changing. You've, got to flow with current market conditions and whatever is happening, the internet, all business moves pretty quickly, but nothing moves quite as fast as digital and you just, you just keep moving and changing. And then the other thing that happens is that everything just needs more and more engineering. And one of my mantras is, he who has the most engineers wins. And you see that today with Facebook and Google. They just hoover up as many of the best, you know, 10x coders and engineers that they can because that's the moat, that's the competitive advantage. So this brings me to where I'm at today uh, is that if you're in digital, this is how I view it. This is how um, a couple of the colleagues that I work with in Sydney see it as well is you have four pillars, and if you don't have them in balance, you have nothing. And they are platform, content, audience, and monetization. And of course, content could be product, and, and audience could be customers. So platform is basically your tech, your tech stack. Content, you've just got to have great content or great product. It's just, that's just the price of entry. There's no you know, second rate doesn't even get a look in. People are, if you're in the content business, scrolling through their Facebook feed at, at a rate of knots. And there's, you know, any one of you scrolling through your Facebook feed has probably scrolled past a million dollars of production in a couple of hours. You just go scroll through and guess what? You ignore it. And then eventually you click one of them. So it's just great content on great products, the price of entry. For product, the leverage is always usability. Um, it's got to be a great user experience. It's got to be world class or it doesn't even fly. Then you have to have the numbers. You have to have the numbers in audience or customers. And then you actually have to have a monetization. You have to know that you're selling something. And there's, that's often forgotten. It's easy to look past and just go, oh, well, we're all about a great idea or we're, we're hitting huge numbers. I, I, can, I had a period in the mid-2000s where I'd be getting called all the time by people who had no idea 
really hadn't looked at the site and they'd be saying, oh, we can get you more traffic. And I'd say, great, I don't want any more traffic. It's sending me broke. Because in the mid 2000s, it was so expensive with hosting. Of course, today, the same thing, you know, what was costing us four or five thousand dollars a month in the mid 2000s would cost you a couple hundred dollars on Amazon Web Services today. But if it's, you can, it's very easy to have a lot of traffic and a lot of customers, and it's valueless. And so you absolutely have to have a monetization approach and plan and know that you are selling something. And it starts with knowing that you're going to sell something. And catch a rising tide. I'm just here because I happened to catch a rising tide. It was all serendipitous. But if you're in the space and you can see a trend, you jump on it as fast as, it can, as you can see it. So in 2007, the iPhone came out. Well, all of the app developers, which were developing apps for Windows, flew as fast as they could to Apple. And that was the beginning of the end of Microsoft's product because without app developers, they've got nothing. And the, and the reflection of that is the Windows phone, which I bought one, had one for two years, really nice phone, really liked it great phone made by Nokia, not an app, not one app, and you really get bored with that. So that's the end of them. The other one is that many people uh, interpret product market fit as basically creating a minimum viable product that addresses and solves a problem. But there's a chap called Mark Anderson um, of Anderson and Horowitz, and Mark Anderson invented Net, he built Netscape, and now he's one of the, um, they're not the largest, but they're one of the, the most interesting venture capital firms. And he sees product market fit as being in a good market with a product that can satisfy that market. And basically that just means make things people want to buy, right? Or they want to use. It's not that complicated and a lot of people miss it. And probably one of the best in manufacturing of doing this is Samsung. They hardly innovate at all. I mean, they innovate under the surface, but in terms of product, they're just shameless copiers and they jump on the rising tides as soon as they can. Right? They see a rising tide, they jump on it, and they just shamelessly copy and they make things people want to buy. And that's, that's the Samsung business model and that's what your model's got to be. Someone's got to want to buy it. And it's very hard to get into an existing market that's already owned by someone else. The internet's evolved. And there is a, there's a piece written by another fellow called Anderson, Chris Anderson. It was written about five or six years ago called The Web is Dead, Long Live the Internet. And if you go back to that article, it's still there on Wired, wired.com. Uh, it's really prescient. And from my point of view, www is for selling things. That's it. It's the, the internet has moved on. It's moved on into different layers. And the only thing left behind on www is basically e-commerce or pathways to e-commerce and yellow pages. Um, and so you're either selling something or the web's a touch point for selling something. And that's, all that's, that's kind of all that's left of WWW and that the rising tide is happening elsewhere. And that rising tide is basically, if we're looking into the future, is, uh, and again I'm talking in terms of a publisher, not necessarily in biotech, but it's happening in augmented reality, which is looking like becoming the new user interface, artificial reality to a lesser extent in gaming, um, artificial intelligence, and that's kind of already owned by Google. And part of the reason for that is back in 99, Larry Page was uh, it's famously quoted as he, in one of the early investor rounds, he wasn't, even, he wasn't really interested in search, he was in, interested in artificial intelligence. And that's been their game plan all along. And today, um, everything that Google does is really a prelude to moving into that space. 
but it's the rising tide. It'll probably be one of the biggest businesses on the planet and Google's ideally placed. So if you're in artificial intelligence, then all you can hope for is to do something interesting and get bought by Google or Facebook. Uh, and of course, the other space that everyone's talking about is big data. And um, I just wanted to finish with that. If you are one of the best, it's very difficult to predict the future. And the person that I read religiously is a chap called Benedict Evans, who writes extremely well, really insightful in layman's terms. And uh, he's, uh, he's, an analyst with, um, he's an analyst with Anderson Horowitz. And that's it. So if anyone wants to ask some questions about that journey. <laughs>